All right. Hello and welcome to the Coaching Conversation podcast. This is your host, Salah al and I am delighted to have with me today Bob Payne. Bob is uh, the VP of Coaching and uh, Training at Lightspeed. Uh, he's also the co-chair of Agile DC, um, one of the founding members of Agile DC, one of the biggest conferences in the DC metro area. And um, uh, I think maybe a less known fact, he's a, a, a chef, <laughs> someone who would like to uh, to come up with uh, good recipes. So Bob, uh, welcome. Um, really happy that you're here. Yeah, thanks a lot. How how are you? I'm good. I'm good. It's been it's been a while. Um, I know just to give uh, some background. Um, I think that we worked together at some point in in years ago, and and that was delightful. I, I always find it, uh, you know, you have this uh, sense of humor and uh, <laughs> deep understanding of 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 things, uh, agile and and. Uh, and and in in general, not just agile. So uh, glad that we were able to make this happen. Yeah, yeah. I've been uh, sick for a couple of weeks, but just on the mend. So my voice is not at at top form, but uh, but everything else is working fine. Yeah, yeah. One thing I I, uh, I forgot to mention you you also host uh, the Agile Toolkit podcast um, that has been going on for for some time. Yeah, since uh, 2005, I, I I publish it somewhat infrequently, but I've got about 200 ish episodes up there. Um, yeah, it's been a it's been a pleasure. So happy to be on your podcast. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, we we connected recently, and uh, we were exploring some topics we'd like to to discuss. But knowing you know how you know my my preference, and I know also your preference is just to kind of let things emerge and, and go with the mm-hmm. flow. So that's what we're going to be doing. Um, I think mainly this is a special episode about like, you know, maybe agile, all things agile, and then, you know, whatever else uh, come up. Uh, so I, I usually like to start with the question, how did you uh, get to this point? Like what brought you to the agile space or coaching in general? Yeah. Um, I, I, I really came at it from project management um, and I had been a developer before that. There's a, there's sort of a very long and drawn out story that I, I just did another podcast um, a couple of days ago. So I'll, I won't go quite 15 minutes with the, the backstory. Cause I know you, you tend to run about um, 30 minute uh, per conversation. Um, <clears throat> I, I was kind of at the right place at the right time. I, I, I'd gotten sick of project management. I happened to run into extreme programming as a concept in, in 99, happened to meet Ron Jeffries. Uh, he was touring the extreme programming white book, um, which uh, was the Kent Beck book on extreme programming. And I had just move from my previous job. I, I I quit without a clue as to what I was going to do. I knew I wanted to become more focused on uh, delivery and more technical and uh, immediately jumped into, um, into what would later become agile delivery. Um, back then it was just XP and the way we were doing things. And 2001, um, happened to work on a, we developed a fairly large scaled extreme programming program with about 300 folks. Um, and it was a stabilization recovery, really sort of hairy program to uh, to work on. And uh, we were able to get that that team stabilized and, and really sort of proved its uh, merits in the trenches for me. And then I kind of thought I would do it for a few years and um, uh, knew that something more interesting would come along and it just, it, it has been, um, it hasn't. So I'm going to essentially retire um, after, you know, whatever I retire, but it'll be, you know, 25 to 30 years of, of doing lean and agile uh, exclusively uh, in my career. So. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that's uh, sort of the the story I I hear is is sort of find trying to find better ways of doing things, and then you know, agile sort of you know um, is is some is where where others have have I've heard them start there as well, mm-hmm. and 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 so what was like if I were to ask you about like the problem that you were trying to solve with with when you stumbled upon agile. Um, was there something specific or was it just, you know, you thought this was a better way of, of working in general? Well, <clears throat> for most of the programs that I was working on or projects that I was working on back in, you know, the late nineties, um, we were, we were doing software Um, we were trying to use waterfall and there's a couple of key considerations that need to be in place for waterfall to be successful. We need to know what we need to build with some level of specificity and how to build it with some level of specificity and the more, the better, because we're going to put together a plan and execute on that plan. And the environment can't throw too many changes at us without it becoming, um, you know, a heavy burden of rework to try to rework the plan and all of the previous requirements. Mm-hmm. And the reality is there are very few of those projects in the world and they weren't the ones I was working on. So we were fundamentally using a deterministic plan-driven approach in a non-deterministic volatile environment. And turns out that's stupid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, not, not the waterfall is inherently bad, right? Yeah. It just, it has some, <clears throat> it has some things that need to be in place. Otherwise you're, you're spending a lot of time, doing change management, reworking the requirements and the design um, because the assumption is at the beginning, we're going to build it all. Uh, We tend to work on the things that we understand best, not necessarily the most valuable or riskiest pieces and may leave those things towards the end. We don't typically do enough testing early on and then we find bugs late. Um, You know, it's just a, a lot of overhead in managing the change and really agile methods, iterative incremental uh, empirical based methods were designed to learn our way into um, the solution. Mm -hmm. Um, Focusing on the most valuable things first, or the things that we believe are riskiest to the delivery of value first Um, and so that means when we inevitably run out of time or money or, or, you know, both, um, we're more likely to be left with the things that are most valuable, reduce the risk the most on the table, uh, that we can package up and deliver. And it happens to be a really good way of managing risk in a, in a volatile, uncertain environment um and uh integrating the learning um from the marketplace and from the changing environment into the the into the into the solution or whether it be a product um or services or you know mission outcome that we're we're trying to drive towards so mm-hmm. it just was an inherently better fit for the type of work that that um I had been doing, uh, continued to do, and then very quickly got into helping other people figure out how to do what around that time in 2001 would be named agile methods. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, um, what you, what you said about the, uh, trying to uh, use deterministic methods, uh, in a non-deterministic, um, you know, uh, environment, um, uh, that seems to be the, the sort of the, the ongoing, you know, thing in, you know, trying to just determine, you know, find out what we're trying to do before we do it. And, 
the you know the 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 problem is like you are not going to be able to determine everything that you need to do until you actually do it mm-hmm. so um so i i i think that's you know in in when i start the this podcast usually in the beginning i said this uh, sort of uh, balancing or something that I've been trying to help teams and and leaders with is to balance clarity with action, and and sort of you know you spend a lot of time trying to get clarity without taking action. You know it's very it's almost impossible because you know you have to try something, uh, and that's really the essence of agile. Uh, I believe in my understanding, but I want to learn from what what what's your point of view if if you were to um just to tell whoever is listening what what is the essence of agile like you know now that it's been 2001 and then 22 years later what's the essence in your experience that you've seen over time <clears throat> So it's a little, um, it's um, maybe a little uh, too much of a reflection of the manifesto. Mm -hmm. Um, And and actually, it's interesting because as we start to look at what I'll call big A agile, the noun, not the, not the, the, the ability to create and react to change, which I think is how I kind of, you know, categorize the essence of agile, especially in a business context. You're you're able to uh, generate change. You're able to um, react to things that happen in the environment, and you do that um, to typically maximize one thing as an as an organization and there are a couple of subordinate things that come along with it so you're tr- trying to maximize value capture and you're doing that in a way that is focused on a long term uh worldview or longer term worldview may not be true of most businesses, but if you look at, if we're talking about the software industry, um, a given piece of software um, will have one of two lifespans. It lives on for much longer than you believe it should ever possibly be around, um, or the business fails, and it and it's no longer pertinent and goes out of use. Um, But because most organizations are structured to, with the possible exception of startups, they're, they're structured to think about a long game. Um, And even startups need to have viable solutions until they're able to pawn it off on somebody else for 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 big bucks um there's a couple of things that come along with this idea of value capture with a long-term view and that is sustainability the team needs to be able to come in day after day and continue to deliver value which is why i'm not crazy about the term sprints because mm-hmm. it's, it's not a sprint it's a leg in an ultra marathon maybe mm-hmm. um and we need to have appropriate quality built in. Otherwise, it's we're we're going to, and I don't like to use the, the term tactical debt is often misused. Mm-hmm. It's a commonly misused term, so I'll I'll, I'll use it here. Um I think it's much more nuanced than than the way it's typically used. But but l- let's use the sort of pejorative m- model of uh, technical debt. If we've got a crappy program, it's fragile. We've got bugs. 
and it takes a long time to fix the bug because it's not structured well as a solution. Mm -hmm. It's it's just not sustainable. Um, And we can't build new features on it. And, and um, it's, it has a snowball effect where it becomes very difficult for the team to manage the work. They get discouraged and in, in, the 2021 job market, people could easily leave. It's a little mm-hmm. different mm-hmm. in 23. Um, and, and and go someplace where they could have meaningful work that didn't make them want to pull their eyes out and stuff their eyes in their ears to stop the pain. <laughs> um so so I so I think there are three factors that need need to go into agility, and that is value, flow. It's number one. Mm-hmm. Right. Sustainability, the team, you know, we need to be able to engage, retain, um, and uh, enhance a team over time so they can get better at managing the value and then some level of appropriate quality. And when we look at the manifesto, and especially if we you drill you drill down on the on the um, practices and principles behind the the values. What you see is you see a focus on getting stuff done that benefited the customers and the business, improving as a team, building in the right quality and trying to be sustainable as a team. So we keep teams together. We would have us, you know, XP had a, had a, had a, this, concept of sustainable pace built in um but always was the focus was on value delivery so for me that that kind of goes back to the roots of uh, of agility um and i kind of feel like something has been lost and i've, I've said this in a couple of talks mm. but I'll, I'll repeat it here Um, when the manifesto came out, it was literally a group of people, it was a sampling error, you know, it was, um, it was all software folks. They all happened to be guys. Uh, I think there were, um, there were a number of women who'd been hoping to make it to the meeting, but they didn't for whatever reason. And, you know, it happened over a weekend and but there's something fundamental about all of the people that I know and have spoken to who were who were in that group. They were making stuff up and experimenting with new ideas. And then they wrote some things down and and unfortunately, in doing that, they created very decent recipes as a be- as a beginning point, mm-hmm. but to a certain extent, people reading it didn't have the context of experimentation and making stuff up when you have a specific problem. Mm-hmm. So, or or borrowing and stealing or changing things. You know, and and all too often I run across, and I'm not picking on scrum teams because it can happen in in any of these methods where it just becomes this new dogma, mm-hmm. and we're fiddling around the edges with our retrospectives, or you know, uh, but we're not fundamentally experimenting with new ways of work, mm-hmm. and part of that is probably due to the, you know, uh, sort of joke, the, you know, agile industrial complex that I'm pretty happily seated in the middle of, uh, you know, where, where people want an easy fix and we say, do this and you'll be fine. Um, But the reality is it takes, uh, you have to be it, it takes discipline to experiment, to throw out the things that don't work, to double down on the things that do work, and to understand that this optimal solution you've found for now is going to be wrong in the future. 
Mm-hmm. And, and, I, and I think that's where um, the innovation kind of got drained out of the agile community to a certain ex- extent um, and was seeded over to what I'll loosely call the DevOps community. It's there's mm-hmm. not like one DevOps or DevSecOps or, you know, you, you understand how many different communities there are just by the number of three letter <laughs> acronyms that are thrown together. Um, although that's calmed down a bit, it was really rampant there a few years ago. And I think probably DevSecOps is the, is the one I see the most or DevOps, but there you've got lots and lots of process, um, um experimentation you see more people explicitly going to kanban that said that fundamentally says we're going to take the lean principle of constant experimentation um and continuous improvement and um and we're going to base it on some principles but we're not going to be prescriptive about practices or or tools now i know i'm going to find kanban folks that are prescriptive but i kind of say they're not doing kanban Okay. So, so I, I, I think, so I'm, you know, I, I think some of the shine has, has come off agile over the past, you know, it's happened over, over time, but over the past eight or 10 years. And I think it's fundamentally due to the lack of self-disruption mm-hmm. and, and innovation from within those early days were just fantastic with disruptors coming in and yeah, blowing stuff up. Yeah. Yeah, I know it's it seems that the sort of the essence has been lost, and as as, as you highlighted the the context of how this uh, the values and principles or what's known mm-hmm. as the Agile Manifesto came about, and then you know the sort of the focus started to shift on just you know the process or give us something that you know will make things work, and and that's mm-hmm. it, and and sort of so we moved like. I know in the beginning of this conversation, you were saying, you know, you were, you were trying to help a, a project or, or a team, you know, you it, like, you know, they were using deterministic approaches for non-deterministic environment. Mm-hmm. And then sort of like we went full circle <laughs> to, you know, to still use, try to use, you know, deterministic approaches in a non-deterministic environment we just changed the names in, in terms of, you know, how we call them um, agile methodologies or approaches. Mm. Uh, well, um, I, <clears throat> I want to be careful there. Um, uh, I think we became, so scrum if, and I'll use their scare quotes with implemented by the book or by the guide, mm-hmm. it, it sh- should be um, an empirical process. Mm-hmm. Um, but what not, and, and, and also this is not a blanket statement because there are many teams that say, Hey, the question, do we need this? Can we replace this thing in, in scrum with this other thing, you know? Mm. Um, but I, I, I get, you know, I, I, I get people that will make bold claims like if you're doing scrum you must use story point estimations like mm. okay who, who says I mean, right first it came from xp it didn't come from scrum it's on the guide and, and ron jeffries made it up to solve mm. a problem that he had mm-hmm. and then l- later to a certain extent regretted making it up because people got so confused by how simple it was they tried to overcomplicate mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, so I, um, yeah, I see a lot of dogmatic application of empirical processes Mm -hmm. and not implying uh, or not um, applying, not implying uh, empiricism to the process itself, like Mm -hmm. in, in not really using the power of the retrospective and continuous improvement, Mm -hmm. just fiddling with a little stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, you know that's fair. I I think so. So what do you what do you think is causing this sort of you know dilemma that that just 
you know, using these empirical, because I, 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 I mean, the, the Scrum gives teams uh, a structure and it, it sort of, you know, has empirical process built in. Um, what causes teams or companies or, you know, even individuals to just hold on to the, the way and, and, and not um, understand the essence that, okay, these things are there to help us improve and, and change things as we go, not to become fixated on the process and, and just following the, you know, the letter of the law, if you will. Uh, human nature. Mm. Fundamentally, people don't like to change. And, you know, it's comforting to know the best way to do something. And, mm. and especially if you feel part of a community that contains special knowledge. I mean, you know, um, <clears throat> I mean, I could, in that case, I could, I could be describing any sort of company culture. Mm -hmm. uh, I could be describing nationalism. I could be describing, you know, religion. Um, you know, there's, there's a certain comfort in knowing you're right. Mm -hmm. Um, now. It, it's hard to break that. And, and one of the things that in lean thinking, you're just drilled in, it is drilled into you that the right way is the way of change. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you've got this idea of Kaizen and Kaikaku and in, you know, in whenever we look at those early influencers in Toyota production system, the assumption was that we've got an okay solution for now, and that it, if it is not changing, we are we're going against the dogma that says the right way is the way of change for the mm -hmm. better. So, so it, it is interesting that e even in that case, it is, um, it is reinforcing human nature to create uh, a system and a culture that values learning and continuous improvement and change for the good, not just mm -hmm. change for changes for change sake. Mm -hmm. um, and so that becomes the new dogma. Uh, so, um, um, and I want to be too, you know, sort of too, uh, you know, too, too gloomy on the, on the subject, but, mm -hmm. but I, but I, but I think it, it, you know, we, we talk about the agile mindset, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's a big conversation in the agile space because the agile mindset incorporates the idea of change and, or should, uh, mm -hmm. change and growth and improvement. Um, and, Without that, we're we're kind of following the steps, and maybe you know, and there's the whole shuhari pro progression. You know, d do what I tell you. Mm -hmm. You know, then we can talk about why, and then you can blow stuff up and and ma make and build your own things. You know, mm -hmm. create your own combination of 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 techniques, or you know, for thinking of martial arts or mm -hmm. flower arrangement, right? You know, mm -hmm. at some point, the goal of a teacher is to have the student break away from them and build their own style or, mm -hmm. or should be. I mean, obviously, people have teachers have egos, too. But mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I think that's where I was um, 
trying to highlight I, I, th this aspect of humanistic um, aspect of agile that um, you know not talked about as much. I, I mean, mm -hmm. probably you know a lot of the agile now is is mostly um, thought of or or you know as as a process. And and even though, as you said, there is a lot of talk about the mindset and the growth mindset and learning environments, and um, it seems that there's still sort of stuckness on on process. Um, and um, so, so what have I, I guess you know to not just to kind of beat this topic um, <laughs> uh, to death here. I, I I think the the main thing I want to um, you know uh, just move on to this like where have you seen the agile successful in terms of providing that you know environment or space um and and maybe if you can highlight some of the elements that that made the that made it successful or mm -hmm. or encourage that sort of growth and learning and trying things <clears throat> yeah um It, it is it is a combination of um of uh people's predispositions culture and leadership not hierarchical but behavioral leadership um that made it it successful um and you know uh that comes in many many different flavors um you know at, at uscis it was driven from the mark schwartz sort of inspiring um not bully what would was it wasn't a bully pulpit but it was certainly a pulpit of some sort mm -hmm. um I, I mean he had hierarchical power but he also he walked the walk and and encouraged everyone in, in that space to to focus on learning and growth and experimentation. Um, and, um, and I've seen it on teams. I've seen teams just start to thrive. Uh, I've seen it on the business side when all of a sudden they realize, um, you know, that they can, that they can, learn and optimize the value that they're creating by building stuff and then not assuming they're right mm -hmm. and getting that feedback. Um, and I've seen it transform people. So kind of go back to Lightspeed's mission, which I helped craft. Um, and, and because I made it to reflect my predisposition, it probably is other people are like, you know, but, but for me, it was sort of a personal statement and, and then just, you know, we, we adopted it at life speed. It aligns with Sanjeev as well. Um, and that is to make people's work more um, productive, valued, and fulfilling. And <clears throat> we can do that at a group level or at an individual level. So I've some pe seen some people that just absolutely you know, cl clipped in and started pedaling, to use a, a biking analogy. Um, and when they found their organization wasn't going to support agility, they found another organization, right? That 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 would. Um, and 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 you see sparks of this in certain pockets in some organizations, and then. You know, there are some that are on a sl long, slow, up and down, bumpy journey mm -hmm. towards, um, you know, getting getting better over time. And, and so it, it really has got to be driven. It, it's it's it requires discipline and continuous improvement. But beyond that, to get those things to take hold, it's it's leadership, organizational or team culture and then individual initiative on, on those teams because um, mm -hmm. because people have to look at it and say, yeah, that looks interesting because mm. you can slow roll any change in most mm -hmm. organizations. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it sounds like leadership is sort of like the spark that that sort of, you know, create this momentum, um, if I uh, understood what you were saying. Yeah, and, and you're cr ideally creating inspiration, you're creating a direction and, um, you know, uh, enabling, supporting uh, movement in that direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's another another topic that you know, I think I think we have like the agile, um, you know, um, community or or in conferences at least mm -hmm. it, it's been talked about more and more the leadership aspect of of um, agile, and um, you know, it's sort of at the heart of the any change. You know, if mm -hmm. if the leadership is not sort of encouraging or you know, um, like the example you've given, like, you know, sort of like encouraging others to take initiative and to try things and to experiment, mm -hmm. um, then most likely it it becomes stale. You know, the whole thing just yeah. come to a, a standing still. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to shift gear here because I know we we're, we're, you know, uh, have... Uh, I'm running not, into your longest podcast ever. Yeah, <laughs> not not really. I mean, we 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 have an a, an hour schedule, but I uh, right. usually try to uh, sort of um, trim any anything that that's not um, you know that's repetitive or or mm -hmm. we, we don't have to uh, um, address it in, in a deeper way. But but yeah, the the idea. Um, so I wanna I wanna shift the gear about it to to go on on community work that you've been doing and and mm -hmm. mainly the um the agile DC. Um, mm -hmm. You know you you were one of the um you know leaders who started this uh, conference. Uh, what what inspired you to start this in in the in the DC area? Because I know the the you know the biggest conference is obviously the agile 20x and and then um local conferences have been popping up in different mm -hmm. places but um the dc metro hasn't really had a lot of conferences uh until agile dc you know came to the to the um you know to the area so what what inspired you to start it you know any, any yeah so um George Dinwiddie, uh, who I know you know, um, and I were running XPWDC or Extreme Programming Washington DC, and um, I had, you know, because of that and the podcast and my my working with the the sort of mainline agile conferences um, was known at least in, 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 in this area, um, uh, by, by some folks. And, um, it was actually Manoj, uh, Vidakin and, uh, Jolly Rajan that came to me and said, um, there's a, I think it was a coach camp. Hmm. Somebody wanted to run a coach. It wasn't, I, I'll have to go back and look. I don't remember the exact name. And, um, so we try, we, so we got in touch in that first year, it was very, very loosely affiliated with this other movement. Um, and, um, and we sort of decided that the association was more work than benefit and that we just spin it off as a as uh, a conference um i already had um uh, the sort of a organizational structure uh agile philanthropy um and then when we formed agile dc in earnest we made it a for a benefit conference and we were focused on trying to do as much as we could to um be environmentally friendly so we were don't have many there's not a ton of swag you don't get bags mm -hmm. and t-shirts and things that may just go into the landfill um we were working with at the time with a um with a conference uh center that had some locally sourced food so there was that benefit but that was um 
one of the minor benefits if I had to rank them. We wanted to um, benefit the um, Agile DC community uh, by having a reasonably priced conference that was available to the community here. Uh, we also wanted to benefit the community to have um, speaking opportunities. So we mm -hmm. tried to create as many tracks as we can reasonably juggle so that we have, you know, uh, in, in some years we have had as many as 54 mm -hmm. sessions, which gives you know, speakers, a lot of opportunity to speak. Um, uh, and so to benefit people that are trying to hone their, their um, speaking ability uh, as well. So it's really for the community, um, uh, for the speakers, for the environment. And then in, in years when we have money left over, we donate any, proceeds to um charities mm -hmm. and typically they're sometimes they're dc based sometimes they're they're you know it it, it it that varies from year to year uh but that's that's another thing that we do to benefit the larger human community mm -hmm. yeah i know the 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 uh sort of the the motto of agile dc you know for the community by the community uh mm -hmm. conference which is um has you know i think has grown uh drastically I, I think last time i was which was last year um mm -hmm. you know fortunately we, we got to uh to have the conference back um after the pause or the the mm -hmm. pandemic um you know and and that was you know there was sort of starting to um you know to come back but but the the year before the pandemic i think it was like 600 or yeah. so attendees and and mm -hmm. And I think, and, and we would have gotten to at least 400 this year, would be my mm -hmm. guess. But mm -hmm. the venue uh, mm -hmm. capped the yeah. attendance. So, yeah. Yeah. So, um, I know the big conference is also coming up, the Agile 2023. And uh, we were mm -hmm. talking about uh, sort of topics uh, to submit. And, uh, you know, you know, the, the, how, how do you think about a topic when you're, planning to uh submit I, I guess not just i mean that the, the big conference but but even like in agile dc like what's your thought process so um it, it it's evolved um so i don't usually submit to agile dc i've occasionally like a few times i've had i've had some talks that i put in and got in um and it it varies based on the conference. So for the mainline conference, um, you want something that because it, it's mostly agilists who've been going to a lot of conferences. So it's got to be catchy. Um, it's got to be pro provocative. I find that workshops have a better chance of getting in. Um, and then for most other conferences, I typically like to submit something that is, so I'll usually have three submissions that I roll into a bunch of conferences, um, mm -hmm. uh, a beginner sort of early practitioner, something interesting there about a particular facilitation technique or, you know, scrum bond was a big hit over the past couple of years, I got a bunch of talks with that, which I thought was so simple that, that mm -hmm. I shouldn't need to tell anybody, but, <laughs> but, but I'm glad that, 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 you know, people saw it, they really enjoyed it. And so, uh, that was kind of a dogma buster. Um, mm -hmm. um uh, I think, yeah, that's, that's well, part of the, of the, the, the thought process it, it mm -hmm. seems like you know you know when you when you think is this topic gonna be you know this is the topic that maybe everyone knows but then you you're surprised that mm -hmm. you know oh still people are still want to learn about this topic yeah uh make a compelling abstract mm -hmm. so put your time in that make a compelling title mm -hmm. that's not too long but explanatory um, and then give decent 
if they have a um a section for you know notes to the reviewers i like to put in a relatively detailed um agenda in there don't pack it too tight because inevitably a reviewer is going to go, Hey, do you have time to cover all of this? Mm -hmm. So, you know, keep it relatively straightforward, compelling title, compelling abstract um, info for the, for the reviewers and pro tip. If they, if someone comes back with, with comments about how they would like you to change your, your abstract, you've got, two paths to go. One that says, I know this is a good talk. I'm leaving it the same. And the other that, that sort of respects the fact that you don't get to select your own talk into the conference. So, <laughs> so yeah. when you get feedback, uh, if you feel that you, you really don't want to change your thing, your thing, then give a nice thoughtful response um, back to the reviewer maybe make some minor tweaks to clarify your point if you really need to stick to your guns uh, and have that perfect talk that doesn't get into the conference. Um, oh, being somewhat facetious there. Yeah. Um, or, or or understand that the, the reviewers, yours is not the only talk. Mm -hmm. that They're trying to create a program and if they they say something like, you know, I know this is a workshop, but is there any way you could craft this into a 30-minute talk? Hmm. Then respect the fact that there, there might not have room for workshops, but they still like your topic, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and maybe, you know, can give their feedback earnest, empathetic consideration mm -hmm. yeah these are these are good tips uh especially we're we're um you know as as we progress into the year um there are a lot of conferences that are starting to come back like agile yeah, I beyond and, and, and i still and, haven't got my topics together yeah. for 2023 so so i gotta yeah. get them get them in so yeah so so what would what, what do you say to someone the first time speakers who are reluctant or hesitant to submit a, a talk what 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 advice or or sort of uh you know words of encouragement that that you want to give them <clears throat> well put the talk in mm -hmm. even if even if you're miserable giving it um and and then try to do um you know, if there's a community of practice or a ton of meetups, mm. you know, give the talk there. It's a little slightly more intimate audience than you might have in a, you know, 50 to 75 person room. Mm. Um, I was very nervous, um, you know, uh, early on. And uh, even after I was very comfortable giving talks, you know, then I would have to hit the big stage and, you know, either do a keynote or open up for Agile DC. And and I just kept tilling that windmill. And I finally got, um, unlike Don Quixote, got, yeah. got <laughs> lucky and, and my, yeah. my nervousness subsided. Yeah. Yeah, I have, I I, I got to give a shout out to uh, George uh, Dinwiddie, who actually was uh, one of the first uh, you know, people who encouraged me to submit my first uh -huh. talk at Agile, uh, to, I think it was a 2015, some, it was in DC uh -huh. that year. Oh yeah. Yeah. It was uh, 2015 so, in DC. Yeah. So that was, uh, it, it, it takes a lot of, you know, just effort, not just to, because you want to submit sort of a decent, uh, talk, but also sort of, you have to overcome the, the, you know the the feedback that sometimes feels like you know oh this is uh you know the sense of rejection <laughs> when your talk doesn't get accepted which again over time you 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 start to think about the you know like you're trying that that the focus is on improvement right mm -hmm. not on you know we kind of it, it, you know we kind of went full circle and in on on improving the focus is not to submit a talk and just you know um not to 
improve on it uh, the focus mm -hmm. is to just submit something and then get feedback from the reviewers get feedback from the conference uh, organizers and and then maybe that talk will evolve to mm -hmm. to something better over time so yeah and submit as many proposals as the conference will allow you to submit mm -hmm. yeah i think just most... do the shotgun approach and like something will <laughs> stick or not right right yeah yeah so what uh what other you know what what do you want to leave us with any anything that you would like to um share before we uh before we wrap up um <clears throat> yeah probably get, getting back to my my conversation earlier um <clears throat> try to focus on value Mm -hmm. um you know uh work where you um you know where you can to uh, apply discipline and continuous improvement we talked a bit about agile leadership and i think one of the key problems that i see is um i mean there are lots of there are plenty of problems to go around but i, mm -hmm. I see a lot of people when they talk about agile leadership, um, think about how much the leaders need to change to accommodate the way we want the world to be. Mm -hmm. um, empathy goes in two directions. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to... Uh, so there's this um, FBI hostage negotiator, Chris Voss, mm -hmm. Um mm -hmm. I, I like his definition of empathy. You do not have to agree with the motivation of the other person like the other person, but if you have no idea why they're behaving the way they are, mm -hmm. you're flying blind. Mm -hmm. I, I, we are not in an FBI um, hostage negotiation when we're dealing with our leaders necessarily. Sometimes they're <laughs> sociopaths and we just need to survive the interaction and make sure that others are not harmed. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but most, most times they have pressures, they have things they're trying to accomplish. Um, and if, when you can find alignment between their wins and your wins, mm. well, that's how you get the win-win. Right. Yeah. But um, if we're in a we win, you lose situation with our leadership, guess what? They also have organizational power and they'll, they'll just, you know. Yeah. They, uh, yeah. The, the side. And, a, and a lot of agilists have, they, they've focused where they have control and that is within the team mm. and they ignore the organizational context and, and the leadership context that that team exists in there is no organism that lives separate from its environment mm -hmm. yeah that's a that's a great uh line to end it <laughs> people are trying and it won't end well <laughs> right right yeah it's it, i mean that's that topic is 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 so um rich and deep that that we could spend another hour on it like this yeah. idea of leadership um but uh, but yeah, trying to separate from the leadership, break away from the leadership, and and just do things in a bubble. That's not gonna. That's not necessarily gonna work mm -hmm. in a, in a long term. And then, if we're not aligned with leadership or don't understand, you know, their motivation behind, you know, what they want, then, you know, we're we're constantly just, you know, using the the agile buzzwords or ten terminology that they don't necessarily understand right so mm -hmm. and and i've seen that and, and and i know you have as well um so what uh how can people find you or or i guess uh connect with you um where would they go i know the podcast is one to yep. listen so to the podcast. agile toolkit podcast and i i think we're gonna try to double post this over there so i'll, mm -hmm. I'll link over to this one as well uh, although that doesn't find me, it just finds my voice. <laughs> uh, um, but, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm very easy to find on LinkedIn. Um, 
and uh, you know, email uh, with you know bob.pain at lightspeed.com. Probably the easiest. I'm not gonna give my cell number right now. <laughs> I get enough spam. Your address? No. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, now when I email you, if, <laughs> if I if I if you email me at that address and I and I see it and reply, then you'll have my phone number. But till then we're yeah, we're on email only basis. Email. Yeah. All right. Well, um, yeah, I appreciate all the insights and the and the humor. This was a this was a delightful conversation for me. And uh, I'm thank happy you so much. We I appreciate to, uh, that. Um, so thank you again. And uh, yeah, and and I wanted to appreciate all all you do to, for the community as as well. Uh, you know, yeah, I, I appreciate we, it. We talked a lot about me, but not as much about <laughs> you as we as we as we necessarily <laughs> should have. Yeah. No, I think it's it's sort of a dialogue, but uh, but yeah, maybe we uh, we can have part two and just uh, sort of explore other topics like the leadership uh, topic. I think that that needs its own um, you know episode and and uh, and then the you know I'm, I'm hopefully trying to to you know start the some of the the community uh, events back up with the meetup and the you know. Um, the conference that that you know we we started in Baltimore but hasn't hasn't um you know hasn't uh planned another one yet so that that could be another um uh, episode mm-hmm. uh but uh but yeah I appreciate your time um uh, and uh again I, and it's it's great seeing you Bob and and having this conversation yeah have a great evening and and um winter weekend it looks like it's going to get colder and i'll I'll see you out on the conference and meet up and an in-person tour yeah absolutely cool